And our scripture passage this morning that we're looking at is John chapter 2. And we come to the second chapter of John's gospel here. We're going to be looking at this first paragraph that runs from verses 1 through verse 11. And the title of our sermon is To Manifest His Glory. To Manifest His Glory. Now, as we get into this passage of scripture in John chapter 2, we come to the beginning, if you will, of Jesus' public ministry and the first of his public miracles that he performs here at a wedding in Cana. And I gave you a little bit of an indication of what the purpose of this miracle is through the sermon title, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, to manifest his glory, to manifest the glory of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at why that is as we work through the passage. But we have to look at these passages, and now as we come to this, this wedding at Cana and what Jesus does there, we have to look at these accounts within the context or within the framework of John's overall purpose for writing his gospel. And we need to remind ourselves continuously of that and keep that purpose in our minds as we study the gospel together. And namely, that person is so that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing in him, we might have eternal life in his name. It's the purpose that John writes. Now, as the author of the gospel, again, John is amassing evidence through the gospel that Jesus is who we've come to know him as here in these verses, the Christ, the Son of God. He's amassing evidence to prove that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh and that we're to respond to that information by believing on him, believing that he is the Christ, believing that he is God in the flesh so that we might have eternal life in his name. And so far now, and in that, as he's amassed evidence, we've heard the testimony of John the Baptist, John the Baptist preaching about Christ. We've heard the testimony of John, our evangelist here, our author, and his testimony about the Lord, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved, right, as he calls himself. We've heard the testimony now of the disciples who have begun to follow the Lord from Andrew and from Peter, from uh, presumably James, from Nathaniel and from Philip here. And as we come to chapter 2 now, we enter a transition of sorts. We've heard verbal testimony and much of it uh, so far from John chapter 1. As we get into chapter 2, we hear now testimony from the works that Jesus does. And we'll go back and forth now as we work through the next uh, 10 or 12 chapters of John's gospel between his works and between words that testify of Christ. We get this back and forth between his words and his works. And I want to give you an example of why that is. Take a couple of pages to the right and turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We have many witnesses here throughout John's gospel that will testify to Christ, testify to who Christ is, why it's important that we see him as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And in John chapter 5, we see one of the reasons for that. Look down at verse 31. Verse 31, and this is Jesus speaking, and he says in verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. They may look at that at first blush and think, well, everything that Jesus says is true. Why wouldn't his witness of himself be true? He's saying this to Jewish opposers, his Jewish opponents, the Pharisees, those that would stand in opposition to him. And he's saying basically, listen, if I give you testimony of myself, it's not sufficient for you. You don't believe me. You say my testimony is untrue. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you more witnesses. If you don't believe my testimony of myself, if you don't believe the words and the works that I do, here are more evidences, more witnesses that you should listen to. Verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent John, and he is born witness to the truth. And that's John the Baptist. And we've heard now in chapter 1, John the Baptist, witness of Christ, all that he said. Now look at the verse 34. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. Now think about it for a moment. That lines up, doesn't it, with the purpose for John's writing the gospel in the first place. Jesus Christ came into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. John's purpose in writing the gospel is to give witness, to bear witness to Christ, so that believing in him, we might have life in his name. The Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, God the Son, God Almighty, your creator, the God of the universe, desires that you would be saved. If you're here today and you know Christ, if you've turned from your sin, you've put your faith in him, the Lord of glory had mercy on you 
poured out his grace abundantly on you and saved your wretched soul from your sin and from the wrath of God. Amazing mercy, amazing grace, amen? Well, now, some people might go around thinking to themselves, you know, I don't know that I'm a Christian. How do I know that God wants to save me? How do I know that I will be saved? It is the desire of God, the desire of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. You have the Bible in your hands right now. You will see witnesses testify to the glory of the Lord as he manifests his glory in the miracle today at Cana for the purpose that the Lord would save you, that you would believe on him and have life in his name. The Lord Jesus Christ desires that you would be saved. Will you turn from your sin? At the response of this miraculous testimony to Christ, will you turn from living for yourself and follow him? Will you repent of your sin, put your faith in Christ and be saved today? You can be saved right now. Behold, now is the time, today is the day. Amen? Amen. This is for this purpose that he's writing. And he gives these witnesses to that effect. Verse 35. He was, John was, the burning and the shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light, but I have a greater witness than John's for the works which the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. These are awesome works. And there are many who look at the wedding at Cana, the miracle of turning water into wine, and they think to themselves, well, sort of mundane when compared to all the other miracles of Christ. He's not reaching out and healing someone. He's not giving a blind man his sight, right? He turns water into wine. <laughs> Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, your creator, the creator of the universe, the creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime, right, as the hymn says, created wine out of nothing, he got a bunch of pots full of water and he does this miracle where he creates wine out of nothing. That is a miraculous event. And it's the first of his miracles that we're gonna hear about. He performs many miracles, this of which is his first. In Acts 22, didn't Peter say it? The sermon at Pentecost, right? Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God, by miracles. Think about it for a moment. Jesus Christ is attested by God through the miracles that Jesus Christ performs. We're not to simply look at a passage like this and think to ourselves, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus did a miracle. This is God in the flesh. This is God, omnipotent God who performed this miracle. And he said, Peter did, that he did all these signs, all these wonders that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know, and being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, they took by lawless hands and crucified him and put him to death. This is the Lord of glory. The Lord of glory today, attested to, here too by eyewitnesses, performs a miracle at Cana. Jesus Christ, as we work through God, John's gospel, will do things like this that no other man can do. He will do things that only God can do. I would submit to you that turning water into wine, creating wine basically out of nothing, something only God can do. Only God can do it. When we were in chapter one and we looked at verse 14, John, our author, said the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Now, for those that were following Christ at the time, they walked with Christ and followed him, and everywhere they went, they beheld his glory. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be a disciple of Jesus Christ during these days? Miracles were like a commonplace thing. A miracle here, a miracle there, miracles everywhere. It's just performing miracles, so much so that John, at the very end of the gospel, at the very last verse of the gospel, says that if all the things that he had done were written, all the books in the world couldn't have contained all the things that were done and said by Christ. It's an amazing thought. And he did this to manifest his glory. So the first of these public signs, these public miracles we'll examine today, the turning of water into wine at the wedding feast at a little town called Cana. And remember what he said to Nathaniel. Listen, Nathaniel, this is just the beginning. You ain't seen nothing yet, right? There's a lot more that's gonna be coming. And this is the first of those greater things that he mentions to Nathaniel. We're going to look, as we set through this account, one, the setting of the stage. The stage will be set in verses one and two. Point two on your notes, the plot 
will be unfolded. The plot unfolds in verses 3 through 5. We see the miraculous scene, point 3, in verses 6 through 10. And we get the whole point of the story in verse 11. The stage is set, verses 1 and 2. The plot unfolds in verses 3 through 5. The miraculous scene we'll look at in verses 6 through 10. And we get the point of the story in verse 11. So let's set the stage. Let's look at point 1 from verse 1. Where the Bible says, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And we begin verse 1 with another time stamp, so to speak, the third day. This is connecting this event with the events that came before. And if you remember uh, from his conversation with Nathaniel, you go forward now to the third day. This brings us to the very end of the first week, day seven, in the first week of the public earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. This is the end of this very busy week. They've had a busy week. We're told that there was a wedding and that this wedding was going to be held in Cana. And we just finished up with Jesus and Nathaniel and Philip in Bethsaida. If you went six miles west of Bethsaida, you're going to find the city, very small town. You can't call it a city. Very small town of Cana. Maybe a maximum of about 100 people. Very small town. Nine miles to the north of Cana was the town of Nazareth, who grew up there. Jesus, right, and his mother. So all the growing up in this area around town together, and so it was very likely that they were invited to the wedding because they were in close proximity to Cana. Nathaniel knew people in Cana. Mary comes to Cana to help. She's actually behind the scenes at the wedding, uh, concerned about the wine running out. And so Mary was also intimately involved, probably because these towns were so small, they were towns where everybody knew everybody, right? And so everybody knew everybody and they're coming to the wedding. Jesus now is with some of his disciples. We know from scripture that in, includes at least Andrew. Andrew went and got Peter. They went and talked to Nathaniel. They've got Philip. And so now you've got Jesus and Mary and all going to this wedding. Very likely that they all knew each other and very likely they knew the family that was hosting the wedding that they were going to. So Jesus and his disciples go to this wedding at Cana. Now think about it for a moment. A wedding at that point in time, a wedding during this day, was a momentous occasion. It was a huge deal, very joyful, joyous event. Somebody in this little town is getting married, and they're going to roll out the red carpets, have a big party. This is going to be a major undertaking, and it's just a, a thrilling event. Many commentators have called this the joy at Cana. Christ performs his first miracle, but they call it the joy at Cana because of a couple of factors. One, the wedding would have been a tremendously joyous event, something they would have planned for and thought about and worked toward for a very long time. The wedding itself would have taken a very long time. Most of those weddings would have started on Wednesday, Wednesday at night, and it would have lasted several days. They would have paraded the young couple through town, torches lit, people coming out of their houses to give them well wishes and rejoice with them. They would have taken the long path through town so more people could come out. So a very joyous event. There was also wine there. Now, not the kind of wine that you and I know today. A little different than that kind of wine. The rabbis at the time had a statement. They used to say, had a saying that used to say, that without wine there is no joy. They associated wine with gladness of heart or wine with joy. So you have this wedding that's associated with a joyous event. You have wine there that's associated with a joyous event. The wine at that time was heavily diluted, about two to three parts wine, 10 parts water. The reason for that was twofold. One, the water was dangerous to your health. You took your life into your own hands to drink it. It could cause you sickness. And so they diluted the water with wine to kill off bacteria to make the, the water safer to drink. But also because it was a clear commandment in scripture that it was sin to be drunk. It still is the case today. The Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's a sin to be drunk, and they would have avoided drunkenness. But doesn't God say in Psalm 104, 15, that God makes the wine that makes glad the heart of man? Think of several statements throughout Scripture of joy with respect to this tasty water, so to speak. Remember Boaz and uh, Ruth sitting at Boaz's feet after his heart had been made glad by wine. This was a joyous event. 
and there was this wine there. Interesting that sometimes we can fall into the trap of not thinking about Jesus Christ, number one, being joyful, or we can fall into the trap of not thinking that the Christian life is to be joyful. Here, our Lord experienced joy. This is just a joyful event. The disciples were joyful. We as Christians, listen, are to be joyful. We have much to rejoice over, don't we? We're going to see several examples of that in Scripture. You know, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, and if you didn't quite get that in chapter 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. It's reminding us, we're to be joyful in the Lord. You know, um, a story, I heard a story about a, a little girl who was raised under a very harsh religious mother. Mother claimed to be a Christian, raised her in a really harsh environment, really legalistic household, hard with this little girl, you know, joyless. And the story goes, the little girl is standing out next to her fence, uh, talking to her donkey on the other side of the fence. And she looks over at the donkey and says, your face is so long and sour. You must have the religion of my mother <laughs> to her donkey. That's not the Christian life. We're not to be dour and long-faced. Uh, we should be joyful in the Lord. Now, with Christianity, right, living the Christian life is a, a bittersweet experience. We are grieved over our sin, and we should be so. The Lord says the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite spirit. But listen, if you're in Christ, you have cause to rejoice. You have been forgiven. Your sins have been washed away. You've been declared guilt-free, innocent in Christ, and you have an inheritance in heaven. This is going to make this wedding event look very pale by comparison. We have great cause to be great, greatly rejoicing in the Lord. So don't worship like a donkey. <laughs> be joyful in the Lord. Uh, don't walk around with a donkey face all the time. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Rejoice in the Lamb. We're to turn from our sin, but you've been forgiven and reconciled if you're in Christ. So now this wedding, this wedding in this town, this small town, would have been a major event, a joyful event. Major planning, major, major preparations would have been made. And at this time, it would have been very customary for the father to arrange the wedding. I mean, arrange the marriage. I like that a lot. I've got two girls. That seems like a good idea to me. I see the wisdom in it. Arranging that. So if they'll let me ask about exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to arrange the wedding. The father would have done that. And it would have been done from very early on in age, most, most of the time. And so they would have been looking forward to this event for all of their daughter's lives, depending on how good a choice the dad was. Who knows whether the girls were looking forward to it or not. But uh, looking forward to this event for a long time, and it would have been a, just a, a major, major event. But have you noticed something strange in looking at this account? I wonder if you've picked up on it as we look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Let me ask you, who is the wedding all about? The mother-in-law. No, no, it's the bride, right? The bride. The wedding is all about the bride. When you go to a wedding, uh, we tend to focus a lot on the bride. When Dorian and Angelica get married... We could care less about Dorian, right? All the eyes are going to be on Angelica. We love Dorian. No, it's all about the bride. All about the bride. Who is the bride in this wedding? We have no idea, do we? The scripture doesn't say who the bride is. Do you know who the groom is? Does it say who the groom is? Nope, doesn't say who the groom is either. Do you know who the family is? What family was putting on the, putting on the wedding? doesn't tell us who the, the family is either. We don't know the bride, certainly don't know the groom. Uh, who is the main character in our account here of the wedding at Cana? Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ the Lord of glory. Jesus Christ is the main character. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, creator God. The eternal word who was with God and who is God, who upholds all things by the word of his power. The Holy Spirit has determined that this wedding account is not about the bride, it's not about the broom, it's about us, broom. It's not about the groom, it's about us. Jesus Christ is the main character. This wedding was determined so that we might see Jesus Christ manifest his glory. This is about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit just has foreseen all those other points aren't important to us right now. And so we're not going to spend much time 
dwelling on them. Now, this does not mean that because Jesus Christ was at this wedding performing a miracle here, that somehow God grants justifying grace through the sacrament of marriage. That is what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Their theology has arisen almost entirely from this passage on that point, and it is ridiculous theology. This is no, marriage is not a sacrament, but now here Jesus Christ honors marriage by performing his first miracle at a wedding ceremony. So marriage is not insignificant, but it's not sacramental. And don't get swept away by that absurd theology. You don't get grace for justification by getting married. You may get really sanctified from being married, but you're not going to get grace for justification through marriage, okay? But it's interesting here that the Lord of glory performed his first public miracle at a wedding. He honors the institution that he himself, God, created. All right, so we've got the setting now. The setting is set. The stage is set. The scene is there. So point two on your notes. Now the plot unfolds. And this is high drama. Point two, the plot unfolds. Look, unfolds. Look at verse three. Verse three says, And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour is not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. So here comes, in our account now, in the history, in the scene, here comes the catering crisis. We've got this wedding. It's an important event. And now we have this catering crisis that's come along. Everyone's having a great time, and the wine is running out. We're passing it out. There are like six or seven tables left, and we're nearing the bottom of the pot, and we've got a lot of people left, and we have no wine. This was an occasion, if you will, for embarrassment, an occasion for humiliation. They really valued hospitality, and they had a duty to hospitality. And so here was an occasion for possible humiliation because they've failed in their duties of hospitality. So did they, did they fail to plan, maybe? They didn't plan well enough. Maybe because six or seven more people came with Jesus, now they're running out of wine because you've got more people that are coming to the wedding. Maybe the young man... This would have been important to the young lady's father. Maybe the young man didn't take care of his responsibilities to properly care for Even the wedding, he's not taking good care of her, and they're running out of wine. We don't know. And why is it that we don't know? Because it's not important. <laughs> you wouldn't base your interpretation or wouldn't base your point on some tangent, speculative aspect of Scripture. If you're going to do good Bible study, you're going to get the meaning of the text from the text itself. In many of the miracles that Christ does in Scripture, if we look throughout Scripture, those miracles come with a point. The word is often used for sign is semea in the Greek. And that word intends to communicate something to us. We might use the word signify, where a symbol or an action, or in this case a miracle, might signify something else. As Lewis Johnson said, maybe a better way to think about that would be that these signify things to us. Through the miracle, we are taught a spiritual truth. Now here soon, we're going to see a man who was born blind receive his sight. The Lord is going to heal him, give him his sight. And in that miracle, the Lord is depicting to us, or should depict to you and I, our spiritual blindness apart from Christ. It is as if you were spiritually born blind from your birth and you can't see a thing. And you need Jesus Christ to come along and give you spiritual eyes to see, okay? We'll see soon the miracle where Jesus feeds 5,000. And then immediately after he feeds the 5,000, he begins to dialogue about the bread of life and the bread that comes down from heaven. There's a spiritual truth that is associated with the miracle. And that's what we're to get from this. Now here, we don't get a lot of that background. We don't have a dialogue that comes after. The point of the miracle is contained within the text. And we're gonna get there in just a moment. But this is a sign for us that is gonna unfold a reason for this that's important. All these other things, not the point, okay? So when you read commentators on these passages, they come up with all kinds of different reasons for how to interpret this passage comes to us right here from within the text, and we're going to get there. So, Mary then. We've got no wine. Wine is running out. This is a cause for embarrassment. Uh, and so Mary jumps in with an implied request. You know, she doesn't ask Jesus. She comes and make a, makes a statement to Jesus, which is an implied request. They have no wine. In other words, Jesus, what are you going to do about it? 
Now, it's interesting here to think about. Mary raised Jesus from birth. And Jesus, for most of his life, was dependent, physically speaking, on Mary, his mother. Now, Mary, the tables are turned a little bit. Mary has become dependent upon her son. It's interesting, as we, as we look at this account, you notice someone that is curiously missing from all of this? It's Joseph. Joseph. Where's Joseph? It's very likely that already by this point that Joseph is dead. If that's the case, then Mary has been extremely dependent upon Jesus, very dependent upon his care for her, as would be the case at that time. And so here she's demonstrating that again. Uh, she's very dependent upon Jesus. She would have gone to him when there was a problem. <laughs> Who would you like to go to? You know, Jesus can fix these problems. She basically turns to him. They have no wine. What are you going to do about it? And in essence, saying only you can. Uh, she trusts in Jesus. She's dependent upon Jesus. Now think about it for a moment. She's gone her entire life carrying a secret, so to speak. A secret that only she and Joseph and Jesus would have known. Think about the circumstances around the birth of Jesus Christ. Angels spoke to her. She knew who Jesus was. She had gotten a heightened awareness of who he was over the course of his life as he grew in stature and favor among God and men. She gave birth to him, though she was a virgin. And she said, as Luke said, she kept all these things in her heart, pondered them in her heart while Jesus grew. She raised a young man in her household, think about it for a moment, who was the most obedient, the most reasonable, the most fair-minded, the most resourceful person on the planet and raised him in her household up until this point. So would you imagine that Mary had a pretty good idea that Jesus could fix just about anything? You know, I have a, um, if I ever have a drippy faucet, I go to fix it, it drips three times more. Uh, I have a broken drain in my shower, I don't know how to fix I have a washing machine, it's got some coat on it, doesn't wash, I don't know how to fix it. I've got an ice maker in my refrigerator, doesn't make ice. I've got a rack and pinion problem in my car, I don't know how to fix that. But Jesus Christ was resourceful. I mean, he could fix the problem, he could fix just about anything. Very resourceful, and so Mary's depending upon him. He would have known how to fix stuff. And so after years now of depending upon Jesus, she goes to him for this problem with the wine in Cana. After years of keeping the secret, so to speak, Maybe possible also that Mary wanted a little vindication here. She would have been frowned upon by society. When Jesus was born, she was thought of as a whore, a harlot. He was thought of as illegitimate. Mary saw when Jesus left the wagon train, so to speak, went back into Jerusalem. They went searching for him. Remember that account? And Jesus said, why were you looking for me? I had to be about my father's business. Mary seeing the last several days what's going on, you know, possibly seeing Jesus baptized, led off into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. Now he's come back, he's being pointed to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, something that Mary knew and kept in her heart. He's begun to gather disciples to himself. And so in Mary's own thinking, she's thinking to herself, this, it begins. Here's where it starts. Jesus Christ my son, the son of God, is about to take his place, so to speak, in history. And so it's possible here also that Mary wanted to prime the pump of that a little bit. Let's get things started, you know. There's no wine. Only you can perform a miracle here. Go ahead. You know, let them see your glory. Let them see who you really are. And so she responds to Jesus in that way, comes to him, maybe with those things on her mind, but then Jesus responds to her in verse four. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus was on his own timetable at this point, if you think about it. That phrase at the end of that, my hour has not yet come, it's a look forward. My hour has not yet come is a way of Jesus saying, listen, I have a purpose here. And my purpose is to head to Calvary. That hour is the suffering of Christ. That hour 
is the crucifixion of Christ, the death of Christ, the eventual glorification of Christ. And already here in chapter 2 of John's gospel, at the beginning of his public earthly ministry, Jesus has his head, just forehead of flint, set toward Jerusalem. And at this point in time, that hour has not yet come, and Mary, frankly, just has no part in that. You look at her response or his response here to Mary. He starts out with the word woman. Now, the word woman in and of itself wasn't necessarily impolite or rude, just really impersonal and not something that a son would ordinarily call his mother. You use the word mother. He uses the word woman. When combined with the rejection that follows, it carries a bit of a feel of a rebuke here or a correction. What does your concern have to do with me. Carries the sense here of, listen, this is not your business. If Mary was thinking to herself, the time has come, manifest your glory. And she's going to intrude on that between the Lord Jesus Christ and his doing of the will of the Father, Jesus basically turns and says, this doesn't involve you. And the submission that Jesus once gave as son, now reserved exclusively for the Father, and the plan, the purpose, the, the premeditated, determined foreknowledge of God was what drove him toward Jerusalem. In other words, it was a way of reminding Mary of a very important boundary that she was crossing. In one sense, you could tie, in a little bit, in a little way, you could tie what Jesus was saying here to Peter in Matthew chapter 16. When Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus responds, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven revealed this to you. A few moments later, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to be delivered into the hands of the Pharisees. I'm going to be killed. And Peter responds by saying, Lord, that'll never happen. And how does Jesus respond? Get behind me, Satan. Right? Peter intruding himself, inserting himself into, if you will, the plan of God the Father for God the Son and the way that God the Son would enact that. And it's just not a place where Mary could insert herself. And so Jesus answers her in the way that he does. It's almost as if you could say here, right? If in looking at the way that Jesus responds, you could almost hear in his words here to Mary, his down the ages future rebuke for the Mary idolatry that takes place around the world, predominantly in Catholicism, right? Right? a way of him distancing himself somewhat. This is between Jesus Christ and God the Father. Matthew chapter 12, same thing happens, right? When the crowd is pressing against Christ, the crowd is pressing against him and the crowd comes to him. People from the crowd come to him and say, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside. They want to see you, want to talk to you. And Jesus responds, who are my mother? Who are my brothers? But these who do the will of my Father in heaven just a distancing and almost a, a future rebuke, if you will, for all the merry idolatry that takes place in false religion. But he says in the same connection now, that mindset, you know, my hour has not yet come. Let's take a look at that quickly. If you will, flip the page to John chapter 7. My hour has not yet come. Here at the beginning of his public ministry, he's always fo already focusing on the cross setting his face toward Jerusalem and his suffering, his eventual crucifixion, his death, his eventual glorification. In John chapter 7, we see that beginning at verse 6. Look down at John chapter 7, verse 6. And this was in response to his brothers not believing him. Verse 6, it says, Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that its works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Uh, flip over to chapter 8 and drop down to verse 20. Chapter 8, verse 20. And again, Jesus is defending himself, so to speak, to the Pharisees. And verse 19, they ask him, they said to him, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words, verse 20, Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Flip over to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. 
And if you look at the Gospel of John, one of the major divisions in the Gospel of John is a division of his public ministry from chapters 2 to chapter 12. We have the prologue, the introduction, so to speak, in chapter 1. We have Jesus' public earthly ministry in chapters 2 to chapter 12. Beginning in chapter 13, we begin to see his private ministry, if you will, toward the disciples and the upper room discourse. And then beyond that, we see his death, his burial, his resurrection. So here in John chapter 12, we're all the way at the end now, the end of his public earthly ministry. And look what he says, beginning in verse 23. Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So his time has come. Flip the page to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, and look at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And look finally at chapter 17. Chapter 17. Look there at the beginning of chapter 17 at verse 1. And again, this is the end of his earthly ministry. His time has now come, and we see this transitioning. Chapter 2 says to Mary, my time's not yet come. We see that time come. We see him responding in various ways throughout the, the gospel. John chapter 17, verse 1, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. This hour is again a consummation, a supreme fulfillment, a supreme manifestation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He begins to manifest his glory in witnesses of himself. He begins to manifest his glory in the miracle here in chapter 2 performed at Cana. And he manifests his glory and then at the end fully manifesting his glory at Calvary's cross where the Lord would ultimately glorify him. But his hour then had come. So Jesus now in verse 2 back in John chapter 2 is on a mission. And he's on a mission that leads to this hour, the hour that has been given him by the Father, and Mary isn't going to be allowed to get in the way of that. So look at the faith, though, next exhibited by Mary. In verse 5, Mary didn't respond defensively or correctingly or rebukingly. In verse 5, she exhibited great faith and humility. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Basically, the Lord is going to do right. Whatever he says to you, do that. So she trusted what he would do. Point three on your notes, we come then to the miraculous scene. The miraculous scene. In verse six. Now there were set there six water pots of stone according to the manner of purification of the Jews containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. They filled them to the brim. He said to them, draw out some now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. From the very beginning, the point here from John is that we have encountered the Lord of the universe, the creator of all things, God in the flesh. Your thoughts about the miracles that you encounter in Scripture will be directly related to your understanding of who Jesus Christ is. If you're a theological liberal, and you don't think you believe all this baloney hodgepodge about Jesus Christ, then you're going to come up with other explanations for the miracles. You're going to start looking for rational ways that these things took place. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that he is Christ, the Son of God, you believe the miracle that he did. This is the God who created this world perfectly. This is the Lord who perfectly positioned us in the universe, perfectly positioning us in our distance from the sun, perfectly positioning the moon from the earth and from the sun so that we don't get swamped with water or 
plunged into some ice age. This is the Lord of glory who governs the world perfectly, sustains all things perfectly by his power. Why do we need a natural explanation for a miracle that Jesus Christ performs? He is God creator who perfectly performed this miracle. So in verse six, we see the water, jo water jars here. Verse seven, how they fill them. Verse eight, the use of their contents. Verse nine, we see the, the fact of the transformation from water to wine. And in verse 10, compliments for the bridegroom. So as we come to verse six, there's a lot of water here. These jars were very large, probably 120 to 180 gallons total. And in this, the Lord here is emphasizing quantity. This was a huge amount. You can't help but think that as Jesus stood there looking at those pots, these massive pots, now filled to the brim with water, that Jesus thought to himself, wow, the, the futility and foolishness of ritualistic ceremonial worship. They do all this to keep themselves clean on the outside. And listen, they would have cleansed everything. They would have cleansed their hands, their face, themselves. They would have washed their pots, washed their plates, washed their utensils. They would have washed everything and everything ceremonial. And the outside of the cup would be clean and they would do nothing about their heart. Just hypocritical, ritualistic, ceremonial worship. And here the Lord Jesus Christ was looking at these water pots just like that. They were clinging to those things that they thought made them clean. And many of us do the same thing today. There are many professing Christians who are clinging to a bunch of water pots because they think they make them clean. What about you? Maybe you were baptized as a child. Listen, that's just a water pot that you cling to that you think makes you clean. Maybe you said a prayer and you said to yourself, I said that sincerely in my heart. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Come into my heart. Make me the person you want me to be. I invite you into my heart, Jesus. I really mean it. And you're clinging to that little ritualistic prayer as a water pot because you think it makes you clean. Maybe you had some religious experience. You know, you remember weeping over your sin. You remember feeling all warm and tingly inside. <laughs> it's just a water pot that you're clinging to because you think it makes you clean. When it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone that can make you clean, the sacrifice of Christ alone, the only way to justification, right standing with God, is by faith alone in Christ alone. Don't cling to the worldly water pots <laughs> that this world has to offer, that false religion has to offer. Cling to Christ. You need the blood of Christ. You don't need ceremonial water. You need the blood of Christ. So Jesus said in verse seven, fill the water pots with water. Fill them up to the brim. Fill them up to the brim because he didn't want anyone thinking that he may have slipped in wine with the water, right? Fill them up to the brim. Make them completely full of water and I'm gonna turn the whole thing into wine, okay? Fill them up to the brim. He said to them, verse eight, draw some out now. Wait a minute. <laughs> Where the miracle, to, in between verse seven and eight, in the lines there between the verses is this staggeringly awesome miracle written right there between the lines in the white space. It turned, and you notice he didn't touch the pot. He didn't, there was no, you know, putting mud on the eyes. There was none, it wasn't any of that. Just with a word. This is just with his word, just spoke the word. He thought it in his head. And between verse seven and eight, the water turns to wine. Miracle. Draw some out now, he said. Take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. We go from emphasizing quantity now to emphasizing quality in the response of the master of the feast. This was good wine. They took it to the head waiter, so to speak. That's what that word means in Greek, uh, to test it. And it was high quality wine. Verse nine, the master of the feast tasted the water that was made wine. He didn't know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, they saw the miracle. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. Every man, every man does this. We know this to be true, don't we? we people do the same thing today. Every man, he says, as if to distinguish, but not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Lord of glory. He does something different here. But we know this statement to be true. Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. When the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. And you've kept the good wine until now. I don't know this myself. I just know by observation. This is what I've heard. That you drink the good stuff for a while first. <laughs> and once you've had enough of the good stuff, you really don't care what the bad stuff tastes like. You bring that out next. 
Uh, I just, again, by observation, I don't know that for myself. Um, I had family, family that actually at one point in time uh, made moonshine. Um, the good stuff came in a bottle. So as the axiom goes, you drank the stuff that was in the bottle because that was the good stuff. And then you went out in the backyard under the stump and you dug up the pint jar of the engine degreaser and you drink that next because it didn't matter what that tasted like. Here is the same thing, kind of thing is axiomatic that um, you, you give them the good stuff first. Here Jesus gives the Eden wine, the perfect wine that he's created, gives it to them second. And it's just an observation here that Christ is different in this sense. He saved the best until last. Isn't that true, you know, by way of an application for us in Christ, that the best for us is not yet. It's not now. Our best is coming. It's not your best life now. This is your best life now. It's all downhill from here. We have, the best is yet to come. The best is still yet to be. We have glory to look forward to. The wedding feast of all wedding feasts is coming. And if you're in Christ, you're going to be there. It's an awesome, awesome thought. The best is still yet to come. But these miracles are used to signify spiritual truth. And we have here a spiritual truth that the Lord is communicating. Point four in your notes, look at verse 11. We get the point of the story. What's being communicated to us here in this miracle? Verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So the significance of the scene. What's the importance of the scene here? This is not a purposeless exhibition of miraculous power because Jesus could do it. Just wasn't a display of his power. Look what I can do. There's a purpose here. There's a significance here. The significance in verse 11 is to manifest his glory so that his disciples would believe in him. Now, doesn't that line up with John's purpose for writing? So that we may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing him, we might have life in his name. Here, he performs the miracle, performs the sign, turns water into wine, so that he would manifest his glory. This is the Christ, the Son of God, so that those who witness the miracle, today we witness this miracle from the pages of Scripture, from eyewitness testimony, we witness this miracle. We are to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and we are to believe and have eternal life in his name. Lines up with John's purpose. Miracles, the miracles that we're going to encounter as we walk through the Gospel of John, are to be seen within the framework of who Jesus Christ is. We are to see the miracles and believe the miracles within the self-revelation of Jesus Christ himself manifesting his glory as the Son of God. If you don't see that connection, if you view the miracle but you don't see that connection, if you see the miracle but you don't see it within the framework of who Jesus Christ and the response that demands from you, if you don't make that connection, then you don't see the miracle, so to speak. If you look at that very quickly, look at John chapter 2, just the page over, and look at verse 23. Again, we looked at this last week briefly. Bears repeating here for the connection. Verse 23, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and they had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man. They saw, they believed the miracle, but they didn't believe that within the framework of who Jesus Christ was as the Lord of glory, the Christ, the Son of God. And they didn't believe savingly in him as a result. They didn't commit themselves to him. He didn't commit themself, himself to them. Flip the page to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. And drop down in John chapter 12 to verse 37. Listen to this from chapter 12, verse 37. But although he had done so many signs before them, so many works, so many signs before them, they did not believe in him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. 
And look at the sovereignty of God in both of those passages. It's both them that see this, the miracle and yet do not believe, and yet the Lord working sovereignly in that. But here, back in John chapter 2, you have a couple of different groups on display. You have the master of the feast that commended the bride, bridegroom. He has no idea what's going on. He doesn't know that a miracle's taking place. But you have the servants. You have the servants that saw the miracle take place. They saw Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with a word change that 120 to 180 gallons of water into wine, the best of wines. And yet the scripture doesn't say that they believed. Who believed here? The disciples. They saw the miracle. They saw what Christ did. They believed the miracle. Within the context of all that Christ is, all that Christ has done, they believed him and they savingly believed here. This is saving belief. This is not a first point of belief either. They've already believed. Now this is ongoing belief. They've continued to believe. They believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is trusting belief, saving belief, following belief, repenting belief, committed belief. Which of those groups would describe you here this morning? Where are you at? Are you those who are with Christ at the feast in Jerusalem, saw the miracle but didn't believe? Or are you, do you identify with the servants who stood by and were no doubt awed by what just took place, but they didn't believe? Or are you like the disciples who, witnessing the miracles of Christ, manifesting his glory. Listen, his glory is manifested around here in the salvation of souls, the transformation, the, the radical life change that takes place in a wretched sinner that Christ saves, that God redeems to himself, who gets a new heart and a new nature. That's a miraculous manifestation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But do you see those miracles and do you believe on him within the context of who he is? Within the context of him being the Messiah, the Savior, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Or do you just, wow, that was something, and go about your own life, living your own life, living your sin? Listen, you can get yourself into this, the right group today. Why would you sit back and ignore, if you will, the miracles, the attestation given here of Christ. The, role, the only appropriate response, the only right response to what you've witnessed here in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, is that you would turn from your sin and put your faith in Christ. Stop living life for yourself. Commit yourself to him. Trust all that you are to all that he is. Rely upon him in all things. Put saving faith in Christ, repentant faith in Christ, and follow him. <laughs> There's no other reasonable explanation, is there, when the Lord of glory performs a miracle like this. And <laughs> like Jesus said to Nathaniel, this is just the beginning. You'll see greater things than these, amen? Amen, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we love you. We praise you and worship you. Lord, it is right in response to these glorious miracles here attested to by eyewitnesses that we should worship you, uh, commit our lives to you, trust you in all things, turn from our sin, believe upon you. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you've promised that when we believe upon you, when we put our faith in you, that you save us, that you forgive us of all our sin, that you justify us, that you impute your righteousness to us, that you take our sin upon yourself, that you make us accepted in the beloved. We praise you and worship you and thank you for these glorious truths where I pray that they again would find deep root in the fertile soil of our hearts, that you might be glorified, honored, and praised, and worshiped, and magnified for all eternity. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.